He's public enemy number one as far as China's concerned. The man who identified and articulated, perhaps before anyone else in the financial and policy circles, the looming threat posed to us, the United States of America, by the Chinese, Mr. Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon, the chief executive of Donald Trump's 2016 campaign and later the chief strategist to the president, has pounded China for its predatory economic policies, policies he believes that must be corrected. Well, now, China is launching its own attack on him, with Chinese state TV declaring Steve Bannon is the true enemy of the United States. Here now to respond, in his first interview since China started launching all these po political and personal attacks on him, Mr. Steve Bannon himself, live from Paris, France tonight. Good to have you here, Steve. Welcome. Trish, thanks for having me on tonight. And I appreciate you staying up late because I know it's pretty late, like 2 a.m. over there in France. I do want to get to <laughs> one of the reasons why you're there, which is the elections. Uh, but let's get to the China stuff first, um, starting on the other side of the world, if you would. The Chinese are saying that you, sir, are hurting America, uh, that you're the problem. You are the demon, I believe, uh, it was the quote. Uh, how do you respond to that? Well, I think it's interesting, you know, both CCTV, which is the BBC of China, and also the Global Times, which is their tabloid of the People's Daily, which they use to attack. I think this is the first time, uh, I think in living memory, they've ever gone after a private citizen. It shows you how nervous they are. They understand that President Trump uh, it, it fully gets mm -hmm. the economic war that they've been running on the industrial democracies, particularly the United States, for 20 years. And they're in absolute shock that Donald Trump stood up to him and said, hey, I'm not going to sign some trade deal which, which we don't have you commit to start to restructure your economy mm -hmm. to fit into the world's economy. And really, it stopped this economic war, both on technology front and on the forced technology transfers and the subsidies of state-owned industries, all of it. Trump's deal with Bob Lighthizer was a very well thought through strategic deal. They're in panic. Remember, the, the reason Donald Trump is President Trish, and you see him up in Pennsylvania tonight, is that the uh, working people in the country, the deplorables, understood that the elites in our country were having managed decline. You can see that here in Western Europe. You certainly see it in the United States. And they rejected that. The Chinese uh, dr drafted off that for 20 years. And in fact, Wall Street, the city of London, the corporatists, they all made a ton of money shipping the jobs, the high value added jobs, over to China. They were not prepared to have a guy like Donald Trump say, hey, we're not doing this deal. We're going to get down to it, and actually, you're going to have to commit to stop the cheating. You're going to have to commit to stop the theft. You're going to have to commit to act like a, uh, a good global citizen. And so now you see him striking out. Today, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, after they attacked me over the weekend, Lee Hood, the chief negotiator, and President Xi went to a uh, rare earth, one of the largest rare earth producers in China, to, I think to send a signal to the United States that this economic war is about to go to another level. So China's playing the long game, right? I mean, they, they've got a plan for the next 100 years. We have a plan, effectively, for the next you know, couple of years. And if President Trump is reelected, then a plan for the next six years or so. So I guess my question is, how much pain can, can our economy withstand if, in fact, we're affected by this? Thus far, Steve, we've been in pretty good shape, right? You look at the GDP numbers, you look at the job, the job numbers, all of that has been good. Um, but if it starts to turn, do the Chinese sit back and say, hey, I told you so? And then do we uh, run the risk of maybe caving to some of that economic and political pressure? You know, the, the, the backbone of this country, the, the, the working men and women have been through a lot and have, you know, through the 20th century, have supported the policymakers in the direction of the country. I think what's most important is what you see is that you're seeing it coming together right now. Those numbers you just talked about, remember, the, 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 the drop in import prices, the increase to the 3.2 over the 2.2 uh, economic growth. This is all because of Trump's plan. It's coming to fruition. We're, we're seeing a decrease in the trade deficit. We're seeing the import prices come down. And so you're starting to see, you're seeing employment coming down. You're seeing the fact of what Trump's doing, his long game, and I think it's longer than a couple of years. He's bringing the supply chain back to the West. And that is where the heart of this, this breaks Made in China 2025, which is the heart of this thing, which was advanced chip design, artificial intelligence and robotics, which China was trying to st basically steal our technology, become a dominant high-end manufacturer. Trump is breaking that right now. And I think you can say, I think, this, I think this game is a lot longer played. And you see today, if you read the front page of the Financial Times, you now have Dan Coats and the intelligence 
uh, groups going around to the venture capital firms, the private equity firms, the corporations, the Silicon Valley, and starting to walk people through the threats to, of Huawei and some of these others. And that is driven by both Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Mark Warner, the Democrat. I believe you're seeing a coming together with the tweets of, of Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi. I think you're seeing people like Rubio. In Capitol Hill, it's been a sea change over the last two years. That's Trump's leadership and not backing down. So you're seeing now, I think, the country coming together. I think we're now having, with Mike Pence's speech, you're seeing that all forces of government start to, to go. This is not about the Chinese people. The Chinese people are the ones that have been absolutely, uh, you know, blown apart by this. This is 100 uh, percent of the CCP, this radical cadre of the CCP that's been doing this. And so I think you're seeing a coming together. They say they can play the long game. I don't think they've got the bullets in the chamber. I look at the enormous rise, right, in the Chinese economy. And you can go back. It really started under Bill Clinton. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm not pointing the blame towards anyone specific here because it continued really under both parties. And American business benefited from that. American businesses liked that, right, because they wanted to have a presence in China. And the thought being, gosh, you got a billion people over there. You want to have access to that market. And so uh, CEOs who are interested in, you know, the daily stock price and quarterly earnings are thinking, I need to be in that market. Is this the place where you need government to step in because market forces um, would be more selfishly driven in that the CEO wants the earnings that they get from China, could get from China and maybe willing to risk a lot and sacrifice a lot? This is, the heart of, this, this is the heart of economic nationalism. In fact, they really weren't just looking for the Chinese market. The central part of this, and, and, and you're too polite and too nice to call them out, so I will. This is the permanent political class. This is not about party. This is both Republicans and Democrats. This is from Clinton to Bush to Obama. This is all the Wall Street faction. This is the corporatist. The, the first thing they wanted was to shift the manufacturing jobs over. They wanted cheaper labor. OK, they wanted they wanted access to the Chinese market. Ultimately, this is about cheap labor. This is why throughout the world, what China uh, exports the most is deflation and overcapacity. And we've allowed them to do that. OK, that's why you haven't had wages rise in Japan and Western Europe or the United States. This is all part of the kind of party of Davos of their economic plan, which they benefited from. Remember, in this managed decline by our elites, the elites did fine. OK, and in the financial crisis where they bailed themselves out is the working people throughout Europe, in the United States, in Japan that have taken it on the chin. And this was a this was a well thought through business model and it worked for people. They were never called out. They were never called out until Donald Trump won the 2016 campaign in the upper Midwest with Reagan Democrats, low propensity voters and the deplorables. Those are the people that had his back and they, they know the jobs left. The opioids came in. And it was destroying the heart of this country. This is what this is about. And this is why Trump has showed such political courage in doing this. And the pressure on him has been tremendous. There's been more pressure from the Republicans, the free traders. And here's the, here's the uh, insanity of it. Ch uh, China is a totalitarian surveillance mercantilist business model. State capitalism with big government. It's not a free trader at all. You can't get in there. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, and this, we've had this free trade mentality and this happy talk for years. The other thing is, look at all the false... Uh, scare tactics Wall Street used it leading up to this. The market was going to implode. It was going to go down 2,000 points. The economy is going to implode. It's just like the scare tactics that were used when Donald Trump won the presidency and they said the market was going to implode. Okay? The fear project turned out to be Y2K. The economy is actually doing, is going strongly, mm -hmm. right? There's been a few perturbations in the market, but it's basically a break even. And I tell you what, I think Trump's very focused. And I think you'll see in his speech tonight in Pennsylvania, I think he'll reiterate this. But this is the beating heart. This is the single most important thing he'll do in his presidency. This is his Reagan moment. This is a major inflection point uh, in world history. It's a major inflection point in American history. Which is why the Chinese are so mad at him and, and also at you. Um, let me ask about what's going on in Europe, and we'll continue this conversation here. I mean, you, you've got also a working class there that said, OK, we've had enough. This isn't fair. We've, we've gotten the short end of this stick. Um, what is it that we should know about Europe as we think about how the U.S. is going to react in 2020? I think you see, look, Brexit was the forerunner to the 2016 uh, Trump election. I think you're seeing here, you saw in Australia the other night, uh, a populist, uh, you know, it was a, 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 a victory at the very last second. And I think you're seeing here momentum building for these populist nationalist sovereignty parties. Uh, I think the momentum is building. I'm here in France where 
Uh, Marine Le Pen has come back in, in a tremendous comeback when she's defeated by Macron. She and Macron are an actual a dead heat for these European parliamentary elections. He's made it a referendum on himself in Italy. Uh, Salvini is leading, I think, with over 30 percent of the vote. You've got Orban, all the populist parties, including Nigel Farage, who has a party he just started about five or six weeks ago called Brexit, which is uh, polling right now, Trish, higher than Labor and the Tory party combined. So you're seeing a real revolution here in, in Europe, and it's the, it's the exact same thing as the United States. Working class people that are tired of the central government in Brussels and what I call this party of Davos, the financial managerial engineering scientific elite that have, you know, want to call all the shots and had let this migrant issue really uh, eviscerate the working class in Italy and France. You're seeing people fight back. And I got to tell you, next Sunday, I think we're going to have a political earthquake in, uh, in Europe, just like they had a political earthquake when Donald Trump won in November 2016. Wow.